If you were to say mother in Germany, before someone thought about their actual mother, they might think of Schalke versus Dortmund, the mother of all derbies. It's a fierce clash of cities, clubs, and cultures, where lions, tendo score lines, and breathtaking atmospheres are only part of what makes this rivalry so special. Before we get into this video, I want to give a quick shout out to Schalke America Podcast. I worked with host Richard Carmen to better understand the rivalry, and he'll give you a more boots on the ground explanation. Links are included below, so check them out after this. Germany got its first introduction to the game in 1874, and soon after, clubs began popping up all over the country. One of those clubs was FC Schalke. In 1904, a group of teenage apprentices in Gelsenkirchen formed Westphalia Schalke, and after many failed attempts to join the official league, they merged with a local gymnastics club, which gained them admittance in 1912. This merger was the start of a tricky business relationship. The club split in 1919, with Schalke now going by SV Westphalia Schalke, before re-merging and re-splitting over the next half century. During this time, the club was named Die Knappen, or Miners, to reflect the city's working class culture and their matchday supporters. In 1924, the club adopted its modern name, FC Schalke 04. It also adopted its modern colors of blue and white after competing for 20 years in red and yellow kits and things started to look up for the Royal Blues. The club dominated local competition, employing a style of play very similar to modern tiki-taka. Uh, they played a uh, this dizzying style of football, quick passing, uh, lots of goals, super entertaining game. And the way they kind of got developed this style, really, uh, these two brothers, uh, Hans and Fred Ballmann, they grew up in England and they kind of came back to Germany after World War I, joined up with a teammate who was playing for Schalke. They integrated themselves into the team, taught the team how the style of play they grew up playing. People from all over started calling them the spinning tops with Schalke Kreisel. With short, accurate passes, Schalke would wear down their opponents and gradually move the ball off the pitch for a simple finish. Success on the pitch quickly earned them promotion to Gallagher Roar, the highest regional competition, and success off it saw the club build its first stadium. But even this was nothing compared to what was to come. German football was reorganized in 1933, which saw Schalke move to the top flight division, Galliga Westfalen. Here, Schalke became the dominant club in Germany throughout the 30s and 40s, winning 11 titles and a DFB Pokal. Better yet, Schalke didn't lose a single home game during their 11 seasons in the new league, and six of those were invincible seasons. The club was on another level. But then came World War II, and afterward, the club wasn't the same. In fact, they haven't won another league title since 1958. They did manage to win the UEFA Cup in 1997, beating Inter Milan away in penalties. That was on May 21st. A week later, their arch rivals won up them by winning the Champions League against treble winners and defending UCL champs, Juventus. But a lot had to happen for Dortmund to get there. 18 boys from the Catholic Holy Trinity Church founded the club as Beispielverein Borussia in 1909, which was where the nickname BVB came from. But unfortunately, a love for the game wasn't the boys' only motivation. Church chaplain Hubert DeWald was said to have attacked and defamed several of the youth. The boys had had enough and used the football club to break away from the church. From the beginning, Dortmund has had to fight for its place. But things wouldn't get any easier on the pitch, as they struggled to establish themselves as title contenders. FC Nuremberg dominated Germany throughout the 20s, Schalke throughout the 30s and 40s, and Bayern throughout the 50s. Things did start to look up for Dortmund, as they won their first national title in 1956, and went on to win it twice more. This success saw them picked as a founding member of the Bundesliga in 1963, Germany's new premier division. But beyond the 60s, things were once again stagnant for the club. A handful of trophies wasn't enough to overlook their financial woes, and it wasn't until the early 90s that Dortmund finally became the dominant club in Germany. Let's start off with trophies. Back-to-back -back league titles, back-to-back -back Super Cups, the DFL Super Cup, and of course, the Champions League. But even more impressive than the trophies themselves was the team who won them. In 1991, Dortmund finished 10th. In 1992, they finished level on points with first place VFB Stuttgart. How'd they do it? None other than legendary manager Ottmar Hitzfeld. Hitzfeld was hired after winning five trophies during his three years managing Switzerland, and he quickly transformed Dortmund's style of play, emphasizing a fast, attacking brand of football. The squad itself was full of legendary figures such as Andreas Müller, Stefan Chapuisa, Stefan Reuter, really the entire starting lineup. And behind them at every home match was the Sioux Tribune, the largest freestanding grandstand in Europe, but you probably know it as the Yellow Wall. With an imperious squad, legendary manager, and a formidable fan base, it's no surprise Dortmund won just about all they could. Hitzfeld's time as a manager ended in 1997, just before Dortmund's historic 2-2 draw with Schalke. But that was just one of their many historic derby matches. The cities of Dortmund and Gelsenkirchen, which contains the district of Schalke, fall within the rural region, 
an area well known for coal mining. This inspired the two most common names for the rivalry, the Reverie Yard Derby and the Road Derby. Location of course greatly influenced the rivalry, as less than 20 miles separated the clubs. The hatred was almost immediate, and similar to recent times, the rivalry began very one-sided. Schalke was by far the strongest team in Germany, so it came as no surprise that when the two sides met in 1925, the Royal Blues won 4-2. And really, they just kept winning. It took 18 years for Dortmund to register their first win over their rivals. And in the meantime, Schalke scored 80 goals in 14 derby matches. That's an average of 5-6 to six goals per game, and this included 7, 9, and 10 nil wins. It's difficult to determine how a club will respond after a war. For Schalke, bouncing back was a struggle, so Dortmund capitalized to become the local leaders, starting with a 3-2 win in the 1947 Westfalia Cup final. That was the turning point in the derby, and it's also when people started to think of it as one. It finally looked as though Schalke had a challenger. The two clubs met 32 times over the next 16 seasons, including 15 wins for Dortmund, 7 for Schalke, and 10 draws. Then came the Bundesliga. Both clubs were founding members of Germany's new consolidated league, which it's worth noting was formed in Dortmund. This era produced some of the most entertaining and memorable Revere derbies. Starting with 1969, the Royal Blues had gone up 1-0 at Dortmund's Rotaierde Stadium. That was before a fan stormed the pitch and the police released dogs to get some control of the situation. In the confusion, a dog named Blitz bit two Schalke players before being removed. Didn't have any substitutions at that point. They couldn't really take him out of the game, so he had to get off, get off and get bandaged up, and then come back into the game. Medical staff gave the Schalke player a tetanus shot before clearing him to finish the match, which ended in 1-1. So this game didn't exactly ease the tension between the rivals. Two wrongs never make a right, and it would have been easy for Schalke to retaliate during the club's next meeting, which they did, but not in the same way. Schalke president Gunther Seibert brought in lions from a nearby zoo to accompany the players during the pre-match entrance and to keep watch around the field alongside the stewards. Goals from Wittkamp and Weist again saw the game end in a 1-1 draw. These older matches maintain the rivalry sharp edge, but there's a strange admiration between the two clubs. They've even supported each other financially multiple times. For example, in 1974, Borussia was struggling with financial issues after being relegated. Their new stadium had recently been built in preparation for the 1974 FIFA World Cup, and to debut with an exciting fixture, Dortmund invited Schalke for the inaugural match. In a show of good faith, the Royal Blues accepted the invitation without a fee and let Dortmund keep all the gate receipts. But whatever goodwill had built up between the sides was immediately forgotten in 2007. I mentioned earlier in this video that the last time Schalke won the league was in 1958, but that doesn't mean they haven't come close. While Chelsea was running away with the EPL, there was a three-horse race at the top of the Bundesliga between Schalke, VfB Stuttgart, and Werder Bremen. Two points between the sides distinguished Schalke as the league leader. That is, until week 33, the second to last match day. Schalke had to travel away to a Dortmund side who didn't have much left to fight for, except their rival's demise. Over 80,000 fans were in attendance, many of them praying for a Dortmund win. And, well, their prayers were answered. Skilled finishes from Alex Frey and Epi Smolarik gave Dortmund a 2-0 win, which dropped Schalke to second place, and winning on the final day wasn't enough to reclaim the title. To rub salt in the wound, Dortmund fans displayed a large banner featuring Rudi Assur, which read, Look, but don't touch. The mother of all derbies, 2017, uh, Dortmund fans, you may want to turn away from here. Dortmund go up 4 nothing in the first half. Back to the edge of the box, and it's been... Shaheen with the delivery. Almost through everybody, and it's the goal! Second half kicks off, and uh, Domenico Dotesco men uh, really flipped the script on Dortmund, scoring four goals, including a 97th minute and equalizer. Plenty attacking! Naldo! The comeback is complete! One of the best, if not the best, game in, in this River Derby history. It's one of the best comebacks in. in in, in football history, period. Who are the best performers in the Riviera Derby? First name that comes to mind is Lothar Emmerich for Dortmund. He had 10 goals in his Riviera Derby career, by far the most out of any player on any team. A notable name I would mention in recent history is gonna be Rafael Guerrero, the left back from Dortmund, uh, has four goals. Uh, he scored in the 4-4 epic game. He scored, I think, in every every year that they played at least one game. Now on the flip side, looking at Schalke, several players that come to mind that had five goals each. Gerd Kleppinger, Klaus Fischer, Kevin Kurani, Klaus-Jan Huntelaar, and Olaf Thun all had five goals in the River Derby, respectively, uh, throughout their careers. Next, we're going to talk about traders. 
Jans Lehmann. He scored a goal uh, in, 1990, in 1997 against Dortmund and then ends up playing for Dortmund uh, years later. Felipe Santana, 2013, helps Dortmund reach the Champions League finals where they lose to Bayern the next offseason. He joined Schalke, uh, which did not sit well with some Dortmund fans. To this day, he's still considered uh, a traitor in their eyes. Andreas Müller, great German player, won lots of things with, with Dortmund in the 90s. In 2000, decides to jump ship and go to Schalke, helping them win back-to-back uh, -back DFB Pokals in 2001 and 2002, instantly branding himself as a hero and a traitor, all in the same vein. So it's easy to think why hardcore fans won't even utter their rival's name. But the strange thing is, these rivals have so much in common. Same region? Check. Founded by kids? Check. Working class clubs? Check. The cities had the same major industries and come-up stories? Check. But I guess it's as the saying goes. Familiarity breeds contempt.